Okay, well, welcome everyone uh, to our last distinguished lecture uh, seminar for this academic year. We resume again in the fall, but we kind of saved the best for last. Uh, just a reminder, we also have our other series, the Expeditions in Experiential AI. Um, one more last talk is happening June 12th. So a reminder on that one, usually we alternate between the distinguished lectures and the uh, expeditions uh, talks, which are intended for our internal speakers. So with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over um, to our provost, uh, David Madigan, who has his roots in statistics, and I couldn't think of a better uh, person to, uh, to have this introduction done of Chris Wiggins. A uh, couple of words about uh, David. Uh, besides his long history with statistics, he spent quite a bit of time at Columbia where he and Chris were, were colleagues. And uh, he is here to do an intro of a visitor from New York today, but not talking about our plans to go to New York. So <laughs> David, good to stand here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Osama. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here, delighted to introduce my, my friend Chris. Uh, Chris and I have known each other for quite some time. Uh, we were colleagues at, at Columbia, as Osama said, for, uh, for many years. Uh, Chris is a very distinguished thought leader in statistics, machine learning, data science, AI, whatever you want to call us, all the same. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm thrilled to have him here. Uh, I learned last night he was born in Burlington. Burlington up the road, Burlington, Massachusetts, um, and lived the first five years of his life there. Learn something new every day. Um, subsequently, he was a uh, um, studied theoretical physics at Princeton. Um, then, no, not at Princeton. Studied at Columbia. First of all, he was an undergraduate at Columbia. He's a Columbia lifer. Then uh, studied theoretical physics at Princeton, and, and has been on the faculty at uh, Columbia for quite some time. Um, he is one of the founders of and very still heavily involved the Data Science Institute at, uh, at Columbia, where we labored together. Um, uh, he's also the, the founder, I believe, and leader of Hack NYC, Hack NY, Hack NYC, NYC, NY, um, which is going on, I don't attend last night, it's going on for 11 years, 12 years, 15 years, okay. So, uh, so this man has some persistence um, and, and, and follows through very seriously on the things he engages in, including his role as chief data scientist of the New York Times. That's been for 11 years. Is that right? Yes. Um, and um, he recently uh, published a book, which I, I think is going to be sort of the basis of the lecture uh, with Matt Jones, a historian, a communal friend. Um, and I had the privilege of, of hearing him talk about this before. And I've read the book and you should all buy the book, Nick Chris Rich. Um, and it's a it's a terrific read. It really is. Um, so it is a real thrill and a pleasure to invite Chris to the podium. Thank you for that very kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to see old friends. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I'm I'm pleased to be here to tell you a bit about how data happened and the story about how data happened happened. Um, yes. Good. So um, it's a story. This is an academic environment. So it's a story that will involve um, academia and in particular a class. So the story of how data happened is gonna be intertwined in this talk with the story of the class that began the book uh, and lessons that we learned on the way about how data happened. And some of those lessons about data will be useful to all of you as data practitioners, people who are experiencing a world pooled by data, as well as the story of the class in particular might be useful for some of you who are also academics and think about universities and how they got that way. So, um, the, if you'd like to know more about the book, there's a short link for that in the bottom. And if you'd like to know more about the class, uh, there's a GitHub link, um, open sourcing the materials in the class. So um, in terms of an infographic here, the idea of these three images is that we developed a class in a book that deals head on with problems on the internet around uh, a reality which is mediated by data empowered algorithms or as young people sometimes say, dumpster fires. So we tried to design a class that would deal head on with the dumpster fires of algorithmically mediated reality, and yet to give students hope. So the second symbol there is an ancient symbol, 
from a previous millennium of a cartoon character who is unreally, unreasonably optimistic all the time. So that's what Buzz is there. And putting those things together led to the class and eventually to this book. But before I talk about the book, I thought it would be fun to talk a wee bit about the class, because the book is really the book of the class. Um, how did the class come to be? So we were talking last night about dinner, about things that a university can do to um, change business as usual. Uh, one thing is provostial initiatives to encourage people from different schools to talk to each other. Uh, we are inhabitants of a university which has been sort of falsifying its model for multiple centuries. It doesn't necessarily incentivize people to go talk to people from other departments, but every now and then you get an opportunity, like this funding opportunity that I received an email about in 2016 from the Collaboratory, which was a joint initiative between the Data Science Institute and Columbia's Central Entrepreneurship Office, uh, which I was so excited about, I forwarded it immediately to my historian friend, and he wrote back to us and said, yes, let's do it. Um, so it's an example of something we were saying last night about how a little bit of initiative from a central office can be really useful for getting people, even from different schools, to talk to each other, which was a story about how this class came to be. Uh, and in fact, uh, as mentioned, uh, Provost Madigan himself was there at an event to talk about it in, I think it was fall 2016, when we started dreaming about what this class would be. Um, and he helped us put together this event to try to listen to people and then ask students what actually they were interested in, um, what material they would like to hear about from a historian and a practicing data scientist about the ways data is shaping our reality. Good. So what did we want to teach? Um, when we decided to teach a class with a historian and a data scientist together, we wanted to make sure that we were trying to give people a wide variety of capabilities in data, not just a data science class where we would fire up Python and we would write some code and analyze some data, not just a uh, STS class around science and technology studies, but a class that would put together important material that we felt like neither the data scientists nor the future CEOs and senators were learning in their classes. So an important material that whenever I'm teaching a technological, a technical class, this is sort of the non-technological digressions that I sometimes want to go on, but then I remind myself to stay in character and just talk about the techie stuff. So we wanted to teach a class that would not only be, teach people how to actually address and think about dumpster fires on the internet, um, how to think about ethics of data, for example, uh, and not only to engage functionally, that is not only to learn how to do Python of data, um, but to do it on the original data sets that we would teach students to learn about how regression came to be and then actually take the original data sets from regression, for example, and put those to work, and then bring them all the way to the present day and learn about what we talk about when we talk about machine learning or artificial intelligence, etc. So we wanted to introduce students across these two cultures and introduce material that we thought would be useful to people who are in either of the two cultures, either the techies or the fuzzies. And most of all, we wanted to give people hope. Some sort of sense that um, there are problems, but the problems are problems that we collectively will face. Okay. Um, a claim for me in developing the class in the book is that history is useful. I still believe that history is useful. I'm not a historian. I'm a fan of history. But fortunately, I taught the class with somebody who is a real historian. We have to start a history somewhere. Uh, so we chose a point in time when there were fights around data. So we, have, we, we could have gone back to you know, people con conducting a census 2,000 years ago, but we wanted to start at a time when the role of data was being contested, which we thought would be useful for the present day. We are now in a present day where data is sort of having an impact on things that it doesn't feel like data should have a role in, and there are contests about whether or not we should be using data to understand that thing. So we thought it was useful to take a time when that contest was starting. And that's around the time that the word statistics enters the English language. So the word statistics enters the English language in 1770. At the time, it has nothing to do with mathematics, or in fact, even numbers. It is specifically about statecraft and the science of uh, understanding the state. So we started there, uh, and then went back from the 19th century, when people started trying to use statistics to understand society, um, all the way to the point where data becomes not a pencil and paper affair, but a computational affair. And we started learning about the creation of computation. Computation, digital computation, is really born of data science problems. And then trying to give students and readers a sense for the present day milieu. So we are in a present day in which there are active contests around what is data ethics. I've had 
I don't know, three conversations about ethics as I reached North Est Northeastern last night. Um, and in particular, the role of persuasion and um, the business model which, which funds it, and then to think about solutions. What are the ways that people are thinking about solutions to concerns around data? Uh, so we started out trying to get students on the same page in terms of the states of things. Fortunately, by the time we actually taught the class, there was starting to be abundant literature of that. So we dreamed up the class in 2016 as a class about the history of data science. Uh, but by the time we started teaching the class, uh, an abundant literature was starting to be born about concerns around, as Kathy O'Neill put it, weapons of mass destruction, or algorithms of oppression, or automating inequality, or the age of surveillance capitalism, or in particular, the role of race after technology. So by the time we started teaching the class, students were much more concerned around data than they were when we started dreaming up the class. Um, and in particular, we found, we found it very useful to make the present strange. One of the things that's useful about history is to look at contests from the past, which are similar enough to today, that it allows you to look at the present day contests in a new light. So we took uh, a hard look at the role of um, the word statistics as an example of a moving target, how statistics itself now is, com it's, we all know what statistics is, we have statistics departments and buildings, but at the time, people had fights about whether or not there should even be data in statistics. For example, this argument from 1806, saying these stupid fellows disseminate the insane idea that you can understand the power of the state by knowing the size of population. That is, even when people started using the word statistics, there were fights about whether or not they should have a role in discovering the greatness of the state. Almost immediately thereafter, people started taking the newest tech of the day and trying to put it to work to understand society. So we take uh, readers to the birth of social physics uh, in the hands of Adolf Kettle. Adolf Kettle was an astronomer who wanted to take the latest tech, which was basically um, Gaussian and fitting data by minimizing square errors and use it to understand society. He wanted to take social, he wanted to develop a social mechanics, the direct ancestor of social, of social physics uh, and the correlate of celestial mechanics and use it directly to try to understand society. Kelly is now mostly well known for the BMI, but in addition to the body mass index, he had a lot of writing about trying to understand what does data tell us about society in ways that we see echoes of today. Um, we take people directly into the birth of regression, correlation, eugenics, which are all words invented by the same uh, early statistician. And we also take people into the initial fights around what even is intelligence. We are now in an environment in which people talk a lot about whether or not different things are intelligent, different pieces of mathematics are intelligent. That was a, a fight of the day more than 100 years ago, as, for example, when Charles Spearman invented uh, PCA, principal component analysis, in order to take everybody's grades and reduce it to one number that he could consider one general intelligence. Um, this attempt to use data to make sense of something as important as our intelligence was motivated by social uh, ideas, but it also came with a lot of truthiness. So one of the other things we try to introduce people to is the ways that people use data to argue that something must be true. And it happens even 100 years ago with the creation of the idea of a single idea, uh, measurement of intelligence in which Spearman writes, then finally psychology will take its due place alongside the other solidly founded sciences, even physics itself. That is, we all are inheriting, particularly those of us in academia, this idea about different ways of understanding the world and a relative understanding of how we can take methods from one field, apply them in a different field, and it will somehow give us new truths. And that is a fight which happens all the time, every day, in all of our research fields. OK, um, that part of the book, I think, is useful for trying to explain what statistics is, how statistics got that way. So nowadays when we say the word statistics, we mean mostly the same thing that people meant in the 50s when they were talking about mathematical statistics. It was a field that really came to be canonized by the time World War II happened, which is to say a time before computers. Uh, and then we talk about what an incredible breakpoint it was uh, for digital computation to be born. That story is really born at Leslie Park. So we spent a lot of time talking about Leslie Park. So, uh, several things come together at Bletchley Park. One, a wartime concern. That is not an academic concern about whether or not you should have p-values or use this particular form of proof, but a job that needed to be done every day in the form of breaking codes. Another thing that happened at Bletchley Park was 
the transition from a pencil and paper affair of making sense of data to actual special purpose digital hardware, which we would now say, of course, we're all using special purpose digital hardware all the time. That was when it was born. That is, before this time, there was not special purpose uh, digital hardware for solving a data science problem, but in fact, that's exactly what they're doing. With that creation of hardware came labor. That labor is immediately genderized, as pictured in this uh, picture, where there are the women who are operating the machines. It was immediately decided that within the complex project that would be broken into different tasks, these tasks would be the men's job, these tasks would be the women's job. Um, it's a, a great story, uh, which I encourage you to read about, again, because it makes the present day strange. The arbitrariness of how people as a community will decide this is a man's job and this is a women's job. It's all clear when you read about it, something happening 75 years ago, and it allows you to, um, to take out of equilibrium your assumptions about the way things are running today. Oh, the other great thing about Blessed Park is the birth of um, a military industrial complex, as it would later be called. Because at some point when you have to do things at scale, you have to do things at a scale larger than the state, and the state immediately starts collaborating with private industry. And west of the Atlantic, that is done at Bell Labs, which makes this chapter a useful transition point for talking about the ways that Bell Labs really saw the future and created the future, making sense of the world through data. Of course, another thing that came out of Bletchley was uh, work by Alan Turing and others creating what became the field of artificial intelligence. So they weren't calling it the field of artificial intelligence, but if you go back and look at what Alan Turing was writing in, say, 1950, uh, in this paper on computing machinery intelligence, um, you'll see ideas that are now very much uh, something you'll, you'll find in the newspaper today. So, he opens this paper by saying, uh, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? That is, he doesn't propose to answer the question, he proposes to consider the question, and his next sentence is, this question is wrong, it should be replaced with a better question. Uh, instead, let's take this question and replace it well with an operationalization. Can I imagine a thought experiment in which, two people, in which there's a, a person and a machine and an inspector, and the inspector is outside the house, and the inspector has to figure out if the machine is male or female, which we now think of as the Turing test. Right? We call it the Turing test, the idea of a machine, figuring out if a machine is really a person or not. It's not actually uh, what Alan Turing was writing about. It was actually much more gendered. Nonetheless, um, this paper lays out a bunch of the vision for artificial intelligence for the next 75 years, which I'll, I'll, I'll dig into more in the subsequent slides. What comes to be called artificial intelligence west of the Atlantic, that is, in the United States, um, is very different from what we call artificial intelligence today. And even what we called artificial intelligence 10 years ago is different than what we call artificial intelligence today. So we spend a little time talking about that story, just so I know my audience, how many people know this person? Okay, so this person is the mathematician uh, John McCarthy, who um, is credited, including by himself, with inventing the term artificial intelligence. That whole conception of artificial intelligence was uh, in a way put on trial in 1973 when the fluid mechanician and Lucasian professor of applied mathematics at Cambridge, Sir James Lighthill, uh, took uh, all of the artificial intelligence community to task for over-hyping over artificial intelligence. Even when it was less than 20 years old, people were already annoyed at the hype level. Um, and in this interview, which is still on YouTube, I encourage you to check it out, it's this great moment where McCarthy, who's very annoyed, says, I invented the term artificial intelligence when we were trying to get money for a summer study, uh, which is true. And I, I think it's a fun sentence to hang on to because sometimes when people say artificial intelligence, it feels like they're trying to get money out of you, and that's because it always has been. That's why the term was invented. It was to get money, which he did. Uh, so John McCarthy successfully got money for this summer study. There's the mathematician McCarthy, his buddy Minsky. They both spent one summer at Bell Labs working with this guy, just so I know my audience. Does anybody know this guy? It's Claude Shannon. So uh, they went to the Rockefeller Foundation and said, give us money. And they said, well, this guy, McCarthy, seems energetic but a little naive. But if, if Shannon is willing to go, then we'll give him half of what he asked for. So Shannon shows up for a couple of weeks. Anyways, other people here from IBM um, and other places that would go on to create the field of artificial intelligence. What were they talking about when they talked about AI when AI was born? They didn't know. And you can tell they didn't know because they said we're going to work on seven different things that now are kind of seven different ideas. So they said here are seven things we're going to discover. We're going to talk about. 
automatic computers, which if you read the description, it's basically programming languages. How can a computer be programmed to use a language, which we would now call natural language processing? Neuron nets, which you've probably heard of, because it, um, first of all, it was forgotten for half a century and then became neuron nets, neural nets, or artificial neural nets. The theory of the size of comp calculation, which this is early days, we would now just call it the core class in computational complexity, algorithms, any computer science student would take that class. Self-improvement, which we would now call machine learning. Abstractions, how do you represent a complex world in a computer, which we would now call future, future engineering. And randomness and creativity, which we would now call Monte Carlo methods, including uh, stochastic learning. So this one, and this one, and this one really, really bore fruit. And some of the other ones became fundamental ideals of computer science. But you can see that they did not know how they were going to get artificial intelligence. That is, the artificial intelligence that they were thinking of was really just an aspiration. They didn't limit themselves to a particular technique. They were like, somehow we're going to aspire to getting computers to behave in an intelligent way. And when they were forced to define it more precisely, they defined it in a way that makes clear that they did not know what they were talking about. They said, the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. So if you think about the uninterpretable world of large complex models, which are fit to abundant data sets, it is clear that we are not now solving artificial intelligence by understanding human intelligence so precisely that we put it in a computer. Right? We do not just program it. Instead, we take abundant corpora of data and use mathematics to figure out how can we build function approximators that produce data sets that look like the true data set. Okay. And in fact, um, that was also the source of fights. So during the course of artificial intelligence, it was not at all clear that things should be done using data at all. And in fact, for mathematicians like McCarthy, that was considered the low road. The higher road was to understand how we think we think and then represent that in a computer. A good example of that, even as late as 1983, is this essay by Herb Simon. Just so I know my audience, how many people have heard of Herb Simon? Nobody. Okay, so Simon is the only person ever won a Turing Prize and a Nobel Prize. He was a Nobel Prize in economics and a Turing Prize in computer science. And I could start listing all the various terms that you use every day he coined, but trust me. Anyway, so um, a young uh, machine learning researcher named Tom Mitchell puts together this workshop and invites the august Herb Simon to come give a lecture about machine learning. Herb Simon throws water on all enterprises and delivers a lecture called, Why Should Machines Learn? And the whole essay is about you know learning. That's a crazy idea. You should just program it. You can go read this essay and see the number of times he says, just program it, which is the way we clearly thought artificial intelligence was going to happen as late as 1983. Instead, um, a field of knowledge engineering was born in which the goal was to understand how we think we think, and you would have knowledge engineers that would go follow around a doctor and write down a set of if-then-else statements, and then you would just program it. And if we just had enough if-then-else statements, then we would get artificial intelligence. And you can see now, in retrospect, that was a bad idea. Right? That is not the way AI works today. OK, how did we get there? I mean, in part, the only way we got there was to create the infrastructure to store abundant data. Arguably, it wasn't that they were really bad at their jobs, it was that given the infrastructure available in 1955, there is no way that you could have learned how the complexity of the world works just by data, because you didn't have the infrastructure to store and process abundant data. That took decades. It took a whole set of um, projects, including military, intelligence community, and then later business in storing abundant data. So we tell the story of the creation of um, dealing with streams of messy data in the intelligence community, how the funding of those machines, including at IBM, eventually leads IBM to create fields like machine learning in order to get people to buy their machines. Around the same time, create the field of business intelligence. There's an IBM memo that we go through about 1958, convincing business leaders that they need to have a bunch of big data processing warehouses, right? We were talking at lunch today about how regulations eventually made it requisite for banks and others to store these data. So there's a lot of things that have to happen before we get to the point that it's clear that John McCarthy was wrong. Right? So in 1955, when he says we're going to get to AI by precisely understanding how we think and putting it on a computer, why not? Because the data road seemed impossible, and it was in 1955. You had to create the infrastructure to deal with abundant data sets in order for this even to be plausible. Uh, of course, having the data is 
not even half the battle as warned by Osama Fayyad in 1998 in this choice quote in which he says, if I were to draw a historical analogy where we stand today with regards to digital information manipulation, navigation and exploitation, I find myself thinking of an ancient Egypt, of ancient Egypt, a large data store today in practice is not very far from being a grand write-only data tomb. That is, grading the infra that allows you to gather abundant data sets is not going to add value in and of itself, right? If the data sit there and are not unlocked, interpreted, and made actionable. Around that time, also, we get the, the beginnings of what we would now call a, a prescient concern around privacy. Individual citizens and members of the electorate start to get very concerned about what happens when you have all of these data sets that potentially can be wired together. This is from congressional testimony in 1984, uh, in which Congress was warned, warned about the dangers of linking together the Social Security Administration, health records, uh, corporate, um, customer investigators, uh, job data, police data, your credit bureau, your banks, and everything, tying those all together somehow feels icky in a way that was suggested as a cartoon here. But the fears that people had were not around private control of data, it was around state control of data. So we spent some time in the book trying to explain how privacy was invented and prosecuted as a way to defend the elector electorate and defend the citizens against too much power in the hands of one place. And in that case, the place was the state not about corporate data. Okay, what can we do once we actually have the web in our pocket, so to speak? Well, one thing you could do is you could start getting machines to learn from abundant data. So once we get to the point in human history that we're actually storing so much data, then we can revisit the question of how do we get artificial intelligence and consider maybe data will turn out to be the high road. And to be clear, some people were already thinking about that. So if you go read the rest of Alan Turing's essay from 1950, he says, in principle, you could get a machine to perform self-improvement. You would just need much, much more memory than is available. So at the time, working with the machines he had access to in 1950, it was clear to him that it was a matter of more is different. That's not, there's no a priori reason why you can't get a machine to learn. It's just you would need much, much more memory than he had available to him in 1950. And so what was born in the United States under the name of artificial intelligence grew out of the idea that we would reason using rules like logic and mathematics and facts. But uh, what we've had a transition to now is that we can learn from experience. To be clear, some of the people at Bletchley Park saw that future. Alan Turing writes about it, and Claude Shannon actually pursued it. So getting back to this point about Claude Shannon, Claude Shannon was working at Bell Labs uh, during World War II on cryptography. In 1945, he writes this uh, document about how we could use statistics to improve our ability to do code breaking simply by taking the statistics of letter frequency or word frequencies from real texts. So he illustrates it by saying, well, if you take a book and you choose a word and then keep flipping through the book until you get to that word again and write down the next word, keep flipping through the book until you get that word and write the next word, you will have a small language model. He didn't call it that, he called it a Markov model. But it is, um, a very small stochastic parakeet. It is much smaller than a stochastic parrot. Uh, but he realized, even in 1945, that this small language model would produce generative text based on the corpus sufficiently close to English for many cryptographic purposes. Um, so he describes in this uh, classified paper, 1945, how you would go about generating random words from a training corpus. You might wish to play with it yourself here is an example. It's only like 60 lines of Python. It's like a little party trick for this talk. I took the biographies of all of your leaders, uh, 13 different people, and then you can put it together and make random words like become principal of electrical engineering, Purdue University, and manage teams in highly selective machine learning and political science, news and conducting multidisciplinary research projects, including Somebody from your leadership worked at Blue Kangaroo Corp and the DMX Group and Oracle Corporation. And Ricardo, who's the VP of the ranks. Right? So these are all randomly generated, uh, generated, a top level, we would say artificial intelligence from very small language models, right? It's small enough that you can read the source code yourself. And you can see how the text generated is extremely dependent on the training corpus. So try that for yourself. If you're bored with this talk, you can open up Python. For example, was on Interpol as Global Analytics and Knowledge. He served uh, on the Institutional Equity Trading Desk at the following his career. Hammond is also 
co-founder of Machine Learning Conference on Machine Learning. You may wonder, why does it look like it's memorizing some text from a Markov model? And it's because you have very rare words. Like if you have the word, I don't know, interval or equity, there's probably only one other word that follows it in the training set. So various things that are being debated about large language models now, it's not, you don't need to create, construct a big black box model trained on the whole internet. A lot of the phenomena you can see by just taking the biographies of 13 of your leaders and running it through a Markov model like Shannon would have done in 1945. Good times, good times. Scarpino was a doctorate in London. After leaving Yahoo, he founded Seagate Consulting Group on Data Strategy. Right, so these things actually, you know, almost parts. Okay. So the idea that you could take real-world data and build a predictive model from it, um, it wasn't born yesterday, right? Shannon saw it in 1945. What then is the field of machine learning? It too is a moving target. So one of the things we try to illustrate is how even terms like machine learning that seem very you know, current um, meant different things at different times. Like in this case where Pat Langley says in 1984, historically machine learning has been either about pattern recognition, which is for image data, as opposed to artificial intelligence where we work on important things that work in many domains, this using symbolic learning methods. It's useful to have longitudinal data on one person, so we look also at this another essay by Pat Langley in 2011, where he writes sort of a sad essay about how it used to be that machine learning used to focus on important things like rich relational structures, whereas now researchers only appear to, to care about statistics. So you can see how machine learning as a field itself started out thinking about important things like schema, and then after 30 years somehow degraded into looking at data. Again, the low road. What was he talking about when he was talking about pattern recognition and from sensory data? Well, there is a field which people don't talk about very much anymore mostly uh, created and sustained by people in electrical engineering for doing things like, is there a tank in this picture? And again, the people paying for it were generally interested in figuring out, is there a tank in this picture? For example, Philco being an example of a company that was paid to do exactly this analysis, and they would use whatever methods work. And the methods that worked were not thinking about how we think and precisely describing things in a way that we would call intelligence. It was an example of a community for whom prediction is much more imper important than interpretability. It is a tension that we've had for decades. It's there in Leo Breiman's 2001 essay about statistical modeling in the two cultures. It's there in the research of many of your faculty colleagues today. How do we balance between awesome predictive power and some sense of interpretability? Whether we want to think about fairness or edge cases uh, or regulation, uh, it's not clear that interpretability is the forefront. In fact, many years ago, I asked you a deep learning group, I mean, like, 10 years ago. I asked a deep learning researcher, what is the role of, of interpretability in deep learning? And he said, um, I'm, it is a distraction. I'm anti-interpretability. So there are certain fields where like interpretability is considered the distraction, and prediction is the only epistemic virtue. Prediction has gathered our attention more and more and more over the years. I think for many of us in academia, um, one example of something that showed how prediction can be made the central uh, goal was the Netflix Prize, uh, announced I think in 2007 and then awarded in 2009, in which prediction was the only interest. Right? This was a prize in which Netflix said they were going to give away a million dollars if somebody could predict the number of stars that you would give to movie ratings. There was nothing in the stipulation about it being an interpretable model, just a predictive model. Uh, and that was won by a combination of teams where they basically created an ensemble method that was itself, like, you might call it a mixture of experts, but it was just basically a mixture of lots and lots of different models. All these models smushed together with hundreds of predictors that um, gave just a little bit better improvement than the other teams. We try to bring the reader and the students all the way to the present day to talk about the renaissance of artificial neural networks from neuron nets into deep learning. Uh, neural nets got rebranded as deep learning uh, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, and they've been quite triumphant, so we try to introduce students even to the review literature from technical uh, papers, and then eventually rebranded as AI, a term that no academics that I knew were using to describe themselves in 2002, and now you can't walk down the street without somebody saying AI. We try to introduce students to the reality of what's happening in industry. So in industry, machine learning is happening, but machine learning is just a small nugget within all of the infrastructure that is a data product. So the machine learning may be the part that's really exciting for those of us who like mathematics, but ML is really just a small part of the data ingest, 
the observability, and then eventually spitting out some sort of data product. So the thing that used to be called ETL, extract, transform, and load, the transform part of it is now a, a large modeling enterprise, but it is still just one part of the architectures that drive all of the data-empowered products that shape our realities. Um, that brings us to trying to understand another moving target, which is data science. Uh, data science as a term has always been led by industry. One uh, market uh, signpost for data science was when Facebook and LinkedIn started using data scientist as a job title, which really sharpened people's attention when you start saying, look, I will pay you money if you say you're a data scientist, and you can bet um, around then a bunch of people said, I'm a data scientist. Uh, Jeff Hammerbacher writes this great essay about the diversity of things that were done at Facebook under the name of data scientist. It's fun to read this essay, you know, 10 years later and see what has changed and what has stayed the same. But uh, Hammerbacher himself was not the first to talk about data science, among other things, again, reaching back to industry, where this paper from Bill Cleveland in 2001, where he basically is picturing data science as a new subfield within statistics to try to undo the mathematical focus of statistics and focus statistics around making sense of the world through data on computers. But having talked to Bill Cleveland about this, he said it did not go over very well. Um, which is therefore a real contrast when you looked just you know, 13 years later and you start reading essays like this one from Ben Yu, now at Berkeley, who was at one time at Bell Labs, saying, let us own data science. And what she means there is, look, people are using the term data science in 2014. Let us, the statisticians, just define what we mean when we talk about data science. So in 2014, this was a rather transgressive thing for a statistician to say. To be clear, Ben Yu is an innovative and um, at home with computation statistician. Within a few short years later, something I was not expecting to see happen happened, which is August Departments of Statistics changed their name to Departments of Statistics and Data Science. So this is a paper which this is a picture which I think is supposed to convey that they are celebrating, but it kind of looks to me like they're also saying. We give up. We surrender. <laughs> okay, we're data scientists now. Uh, and having talked to some of the faculty about that change, that was sort of the vibe I got. They were like, "All right, whatever. We're data scientists now." <laughs> you know, statistics, 1770 through 2017. Now, data science. Okay. Um, one thing that I've talked about quite a bit with a number of people over the last couple of hours is the role of ethics in data. For many people, ethics and data is synonymous with privacy, so we try to introduce people to that facet of ethics. The fact that your data, if you may think of it as private, but it's quite easy to take your data that are private, meaning anonymized, and other data that are not anonymized, merge them together and reveal, and to link together your name with a bunch of uh, data that you may not necessarily want transmitted in different contexts. Uh, so we focus on the work of Latanya Sweeney. We introduce students to um, ways that unfairness happens in high-stakes situations. A good example of that was this 2016 paper by ProPublica looking at use of automated decision systems by a commercial company in the judicial system in Florida where judges were making decisions informed by a complete black box algorithm where there was an, um, an active debate about whether or not this algorithm was fair in some sort of technical sense. We try to introduce students to the debates over what we talk about when we talk about ethics. We who come from academia are often thinking about ethics in terms of a context called human subjects research, which is a well-established framework for applied ethics since like 1978. By 2016, people were starting to ask, where are the human subjects in big data, which is what we used to call it at the time. So this is a paper by um, STS scholars about Facebook and other information platform companies. What are they talking about when they come from the human subjects research community? Well, they're talking about this very ancient framework for applied ethics, uh, which is canonized in the Belmont Report. It's a very small framework of three basic ethical principles, which are designed to be in tension. This framework is largely forgotten, and you can tell that it's forgotten because when you go to Amazon and you look for the Belmont Report, it appears as forgotten books. Kind of <laughs> sad. I think that's what Amazon calls its printing on demand effort. Like nobody, bought, nobody reads the Belmont Report anymore, so there you have it. Um, more modern incarnations think about not just how you define ethics, but how you design for ethics. So we talk about how, in a company, ethics can happen at various pause points in product development. This is from the Markula Center, um, which has been working for decades to try to explain how you can do applied ethics in the context of tech companies. That said, you know. 
creating an ethics company, creating an ethics team doesn't mean you solve the problem. One of the things we talk about is the waxing and waning of ethics teams. Right almost exactly when our book came out, there was this headline of various companies that were laying off all of their um, ethicists. So people have hired ethicists, people have fired ethicists. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a battle. We try to end the book with hope, and the hope that we try to end with is by trying to understand power. So we spend some time talking about all the regulatory forces that work on a company, uh, or and I only say a company because now we're at a day and age where the data power is not in the hands of the state. The data power is in the hands of private companies. Often people look to the state and they say, okay, well, something is of concern in terms of um, the power in the, in the hands of private companies. The state should do something about it and fix it. Federal government should get in there and make a law. There ought to be a law. But we're trying to explain to people that that's only one of the arrows in the unstable game among these three players, right? The companies, they do effectively deplatform each other. Private individuals have all sorts of ways in which they perform private ordering. Uh, so we try to elaborate in the last chapter of the book all the different unstable uh, arrangements of power between state power, corporate power, and what might be called people power. Also useful for students is to explain how it can be the case that you can get different people understanding technologies in different ways. So we try to explain the hype cycle, the idea that a new technology shows up and we are in a period of irrational exuberance, and then eventually we get to an efficient place of rational exuberance. Not a new idea to me, this is from Harvard Business Review. <coughs> and much older, it's from a, a report by Gartner, which is a consulting company, with this idea that every time some new technology happens, some people are gonna be irrationally exuberant about it, and they think it's gonna be solve all their problems, and then they realize it doesn't solve all their problems, and there's a trough of negativity, and then eventually you get to some efficient place. What's exciting about new technologies is, you can be having a conversation with somebody who's at a very different point on the hype cycle from you. Right now, we're sort of all at different points in the hype cycle at the same time. So um, what do we hope people get out of the book? Uh, well, we hope it's the same thing that the students got out of the class. For us, as the people teaching the class, we went into the class thinking, we're going to write a history of data science. We're going to talk about John Tukey, Bell Labs, and I don't know, other stuff. Um, and the students really pushed us to think about the role of data in society. Like, how do we make sense of the power of the state, the power of private companies, what is the role of regulation writ large, not just laws, but the various ways that norms, laws, markets, and architecture all sort of shape power? And how can we um, not shy away from ethics, which again, I spent most of my life without saying the word ethics, but uh, and in some sort of professional context. Um, how can we think about ethics in a way and, and deal with it head on as part of our analysis of data? Um, we learned in the process of teaching the class that there is important material that's not being taught to our students. And I don't just mean that the statisticians are not learning fuzzy stuff from the humanists, or like the humanists, humanists are learning stuff that the statisticians are learning, but there's material that's not being taught to the future statisticians, but also not being taught to the future senators and the CEOs. All sorts of uh, context that we think is important for understanding how data is shaping our realities. And the role of data, truth, and power together. Uh, after we taught the class for several years, I said to my co-author one day, you know, I just realized that our class is about truth and power. And then afterwards, I realized, you know, every class should be about truth and power. Wouldn't it be more fun if whatever your class was, it was, you know, linear algebra and truth and power. Um, so we try to be upfront in the book about the way that data is used rhetorically to argue that something is more true because we have data and about the ways that the appearance of data conveys a, a type of truthiness. And we try to be upfront also about the role of power. You know, every chapter has a transition and who can do what. And often the people who get that capability first are the people who are already in power. Very rarely in the book does somebody use that power to somehow empower the defenseless. Usually it's being used to defend that power. That's part of the story which I think is, uh, I hope, useful to the readers and the students going forward is that is a story which I do not predict will change anytime soon. Um, and with that, I return to the URLs. If you'd like to know more about the class, it's at the first URL. And if you'd like to know more about the book, it's at the second. And with that, I think we have some time to ask questions. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, Thanks very much for a great talk. I'm sure there's a lot of questions here. There's been questions coming in online. Uh, 
I will do a uh, mix of questions I prepared and I'm curious about with questions that came online. And then of course, we wanna take questions from folks in the room uh, and see what you think. Uh, I found the talk to be very uh, thought provoking. This is the second time I've, I've seen the talk, but this is a different, you know, each time Chris talks, it's slightly different. Um, and I found the book, by the way, I'll uh, join Provost Madigan in endorsing the book, something I rarely do. I love the book, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> so um, let me start. I, I, I know you're the optimist and you're the buzz light here of, uh, of statistics <laughs> or computer science, but let me start with something uh, on the worry side. So uh, what worries you most about data in this new digitized world we, we live in where kind of almost everything in our lives is, is being recorded, digitized. Um, you know, part one is, is, is privacy gone? And part two is analytical thinking kind of encumbered or enabled in that kind of environment? Hmm. All right, well, you asked me to be a pessimist, but then you also asked me a an open question. So for the second question, the open question, yes, I'm an optimist. So I would not say that analytical thinking is over. Uh, I, I still think that analytical thinking is useful. And if anything, the tool set that we can use to expedite, facilitate, and clarify analytical thinking is getting more and more at our fingertips all the time. Now, if you ask me to be pessimistic or worried uh, about data, it's really, uh, I, I would say the lens is still power. You know, that um, data gives capabilities, and those capabilities are often available first to those who are in power, as I, as I say at my close. So um, I think that's a, a concern about unchecked power, and that's true whenever power is unchecked. Right now, power is in the hand of uh, people that have abundant data and, and abundant technology. And when I say people, I really mean private companies, because unlike the situation in the 70s and 80s, the abundance of data is not so much in the state, at least not in the US, uh, but more really in the hands of private companies. So unchecked power is, is a concern. Um, privacy, you asked about, we have not had major society-wide privacy breaches lately. We have sort of focused occasional privacy breaches, but you're right that you know many people give effectively all of their data to a small number of companies those companies wisely have chosen extremely talented um, CISOs, chief information security officers, uh, who heretofore have done a pretty good job defending our data, but you could imagine a couple of high visibility leaks that could really mess things up, right? And those leaks often happen in small ways. I think a major search company just had a bunch of documentation of its search procedures leaked in the last 48 hours, for example. Um, so it's not, nobody's perfect, right? Even, even when you're a powerful or multiple trillion dollar company, you're not perfect. So there's a real concern that something bad will happen. Often US law is reactive to extremely bad things. We get a new branch of government or a new federal agency after a particular crash um, or concern. So perhaps there will be a reaction, perhaps not. But I would say that in terms of your, your, your question, I'm still optimistic about people's analytic ability. I, I don't think that creating more tooling somehow replaces or deadens the capacity for analytic ability. And as far as the first question, uh, what am I worried about? I'm worried about unchecked power. It's just right now, unchecked power happens to be tightly associated with abundant data sets. Yeah. So that that answer actually makes me jump to some later questions I, I was planning to ask later, but I'll I'll ask them now. Uh, and it is around kind of the, the power of the state moving uh, into companies, right? D data collection, especially at scale, and its leverage in AI requires major budgets and investments, which creates a dependency on these larger players. You know, they're, they're operating at a scale where nobody else could do it. If we're gonna play the same game that they're playing, um, is this increasing scale kind of further entrenching them as the holders of power? Is there anything we can do about changing that dynamic? Yeah, so that's not new. I mean, if you look at in the book at the history of computation, you can see how computation was a state concern, almost immediately became a corporate concern. And then it was hand in glove relationships between private companies and the US government, right? One of the chapters I think opens with this quote from uh, Sully Kulbeck, 
who's near his retirement, after his retirement, he's interviewed by the NSA in a later declassified oral history. And he says of Bell Labs, quote, let's just say they were more than happy to work with us, us being the NSA. So, uh, you know, the story of governments working with companies that had capabilities outstripping those of the government, that's been true for decades, right? It's not just true in the last few years. So that sort of relationship uh, has played out before, including with instability, Bell Labs being an example, right? Bell Labs and the US government clearly worked, as, as Kulbeck said, uh, more than happy to work with each other for a long time. At some point, they you know, clearly didn't need Bell Labs as much as they did. The government tolerated monopoly that was Bell Labs was eventually taken apart, right? And there was a diaspora of talent to a lot of other companies, Yahoo included. Mm -hmm. um, so just because something is the incumbent doesn't mean it's forever. Yeah, so a quick a quick follow up on that one, and that's a, that's a great point. Uh, just drilling down on it a little bit in terms of, you know, what's what's the hope here, uh, Mr. Buzz, uh, that will kind of empower more of a, a AI for good, et cetera, in a cycle where, I mean, what worries me in particular is kind of you collect data which enables AI. As you do more AI, you actually end up getting more data. So AI begets data, begets AI, begets data, and they have that cycle. Yep. And it seems I, to get I, worse. Kai Fuli has a book where he specifically calls out this virtuous yes. cycle of computation and data. So so what, what do we do to redirect it to kind of AI for good or public good or concern like that? Is there anything we can do? Sure. I mean, there's norms, laws, markets, and architecture as different forces that regulate. So we think about law as the only force that regulates. Our norms themselves shape what people do. Markets shape what people do when we choose to spend money on different things. Architecture, in this case, means technology, which suddenly changes things, and the other, um, those other forces sort of react to fast changes in architecture. So you make a new technology, almost immediately the market responds and people start making you know, books about that new technology. And then later our norms change and people establish, you know, is it okay to use this technology in some new context? And then much later laws respond. But what has to happen for laws to respond, particularly laws to respond in a way that's regulatory? Well, harms need to occur. Those harms need to be um, illustrated. Somebody needs to expose that harm. The harms need to be attributed to some particular party that's going to be on the receiving end of that regulation. The electorate or the market needs to activate some sort of regulatory force. And that regulatory force needs not to be captured by lobbying. Right? So there's a lot of things that need to happen in order for some sort of regulatory force, usually the state, to uh, reshape power that is unchecked. Uh, but I, I think that's a reasonable playbook, and it's a playbook that requires vigilance at all steps. Right, You need to make sure that the harms are illustrated. You need to make sure that you have some amount of investigation in your society in which those harms can be revealed. You need to have some commitment to, for example, critical thinking so that you won't be distracted about whether or not that harm is real. You need to have some critical thinking about attributing that harm to some party that could be on the receiving end of the regulation. And then you need to be vigilant to make sure that that regulation is not captured, whether it's by self-regulatory organizations that are um, you know, funded by and, and sometimes shaped by the powers, the centers of power, or eventually by um, government, that it's not somehow captured under lobbying or some other form of regulatory capture. Yeah, complicated stuff. So I'm going to take a shift for a few questions and, and get more technical. And I'll, I'll use one question that came uh, online from uh, uh, Omer Alish from our uh, AI Solutions Hub up in uh, Portland, Maine. Um, how, how does the history of machine learning differ from the history of other statistical approaches? And how did that change its adoption over the last few decades with kind of the rise of data? So the history of ML, at least under the term ML, goes, you know, 1980, 1959 through around, let's say, 2015, when it gets rebranded. The history of statistics goes arguably since 1770, when that word in, in, enters the English language. But really, I would say, from the IPO of Guinness all the way until post-World War II, when mathematical statistics is really canonized as an academic discipline. So there's a couple of differences there. One is the role of computers, right? Statistics was invented before computation, right? 
Uh, and so the role of statistics and computers is very different than the role of machine learning and computers. In part as a mindset and in part in terms of like what you do when you're talking about machine learning. The other related point is the role of industry. So, you know, the original advancements in statistics were from governments that wanted to improve agriculture. This includes uh, Poland, which was the concern of Jersey Neyman, who would go on to um, help create the field of mathematical statistics. And Ari Fisher himself, right, in his work in, in England, trying to improve agriculture. But it has a big shot in the arm from Guinness, the beer company, which was the hot IPO of the late 19th century and used its funding to hire statisticians. So a lot of the early statistical techniques were invented first in industry or in agriculture and then became a mathematical concern and then an academic concern. Whereas machine learning has been really solidly an industry-led uh, concern since IBM, you know, the, the phrase is usually attributed to a, a tech memo from IBM uh, and really was advanced under mostly corporate, somewhat military concerns. So it, it grew up at a very different uh, time and place, right? Industry rather than academia, armed with computation rather than armed with pencil and paper. So, I mean, to me, it always kind of harkens back uh, ethos and, and mindset, right? Statistics has the ethos of the hypotheses come from humans and how do we verify them and test them? Machine learning, it's more like, what can the machine discover? What can the machine provide? Uh, without the humans kind of coming up with the hypotheses. Is that is that a good characterization or not quite? You're, you're touching on a couple of different, um, what are we trying to do when we make sense of the world through data? I think that's the question to keep in mind. Are we trying to describe the world? Are we trying to confirm some particular model? Are we trying to explore how the world works in a data set? Or are we trying to optimize something? And a lot of machine learning now is used in industry to optimize something. Statistics, as you're kind of portraying it, is about confirming a model and, and learning some parameters or inferring some parameters. A different concern is using a data set and simply exploring that data set and seeing what things will come out of it. Now, I suspect, you know, look, you're coming from a, a world of KDD and, and discovery, right? And there's a D there for discovery. But it also reminds me of uh, Tukey and how he contrasted confirmatory and exploratory data analysis. So John Tukey, who was at Bell Labs, who's very mathematical by background, but really saw the future at Bell Labs, um, writes about exploratory and confirmatory statistics. Confirmatory statistics is this idea that you have a model and you want to confirm that you're going to infer the parameters correctly in the limit of large n. Exploratory is you have a bunch of data and you don't exactly know what's going on with those data. You don't necessarily have a model to compare it to. And you have to develop some way of understanding what the data looks like which was very difficult when, when Tukey starts writing about exploratory data analysis in the 70s, that he didn't have a, a abundant good software or um, good visualization tools to work with. So I think part of it is, is just stepping back and asking, what, what is the point? What am I trying to do with this data? Am I trying to confirm one particular model? Is there a thing I'm trying to optimize for, which is the engineering concern of machine learning and industry? Or am I trying to simply explore these data and figure out what is even going on in this data set? Yeah. And I've gotten myself in a lot of trouble whenever I push the exploratory side of statistics in the Why? in that community. Um, John Tukey wrote a whole book about it, about yeah, EDA. But, yeah. I mean, that's the point of Tukey <laughs> writing a book He's about EDA, is to argue <laughs> this is a craft. Let us accept that exploratory data analysis is a craft. True. So um, let me now kind of get a bit more technical. Uh, hi historically, we've been dependent on data analysis by measuring attributes. And his attributes and historically they've been numerical ones and he talked about the long way and kind of the average man and, and, and statistics around that uh, for scientific analysis for understanding statistical phenomena what would be the story for unstructured data text images audio video where where you get different kinds of distributions and, and maybe we'll go into the distributions uh, power laws and, and 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 categorical data and so forth how, how does that shift happen? There has been some several shifts. So in terms of language, uh, as you know, for, for many years, it was believed that understanding language mattered, right? So it was believed that if you wanted to do natural language processing, it would be useful to understand language first. Uh, we are now, we have now left that. We are now untethered by that constraint, right? And so for a long time, it was believed that to understand language, you need to have linguists around 
understand translation, you need to understand, you need to have people understand how to represent the language in a way that a computer can understand, which first you had to understand language. That was the belief. Um, again, getting back to the part of the story of the book, which is the belief first that data is the low road, but then armed with enough data, you see that more is different and you can take a different path. We are no longer there with respect to language modeling, right? The, the words themselves are mere tokens and the task has been to become, to predict the next token irrespective of any understanding of how language works. That is um, not the way that natural language processing developed for you know, the last 75 years. And that goal of getting a computer to understand natural language, it's right there in the proposal from 1955 about what artificial intelligence should include. That was one of the challenges that they wanted to understand. Image data is an interesting case where we are now at that point also, where image data, you can do an okay job just treating it as you know abstract sets of pixels. It is still the case, though, that a lot of domain expertise is brought to bear, including, say, the structure of a convolutional neural net, right, which presupposes something about the way images should be represented on a computer. Uh, before that, a set of basis features for decomposing an image into things that sort of made sense to us, you know, edges and things like that, right, that had some domain expertise. And before that, plenty of work that was very generative in which you would write down a probability distribution given the latent things that you were trying to infer, let's say segmentation of black white images by saying, look, there's gonna be a bunch of pixels that are high values, pixels that are low values, I'll write down a Gaussian mixture model. And those methods are pretty simple and yet they do a pretty good job on basic image uh, manipulation tasks. But again, today we're at this weird time where you can just give enough data and you can just give raw pixels to the appropriate machine learning algorithm and solve problems, not necessarily understanding the word problems, world problems or interpretability problems. But you can get you know amazing results for detecting hot dog versus not hot dog or something like that um, without any domain expertise. It's weird times. It's uh, I mean I'll have to react to that one. So the the there's a difference between kind of reacting to text text or coming up with the right phrases versus actually understanding what the natural language is saying. Uh, are, are you proposing that these stochastic parrots are forming an understanding? I try very hard to stay away from words like understanding in the same way that Alan Turing encouraged us to stay away from stay away from the question, can machines think? You know, the opening of, of probably his most famous, well, maybe after Church Night, but okay, second most famous paper, this paper that I presented says, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? And he immediately says, that's an ill-posed question. Don't think it. And so for um, natural words like understanding, uh, I try to stay away from it because I, you know, I just, you're gonna get into debates about what actually it means. And it's there with Spearman and intelligence, right? Intelligence and understanding are words where when technologists get in there and they wanna be analytic about it, often as they try to slice the thing, it goes through their fingers, so to speak, because they realize that uh, it's not a very well-defined term. Okay, fair. Um, so we we have entered the age of uh, generative AI. And one of the things, like to me at least, it means that somehow uh, leveraging unstructured data, which for a long, long time was kind of not leveraged enough. And the only way we dealt with unstructured data is by sitting down, defining attributes, feature engineering, uh, that we think capture meaning and kind of transposing it to that space. Now you, you kind of don't worry about it. Let the deep learning neural network figure out what the features are, et cetera, and, and work from there. What, what does that mean kind of for our notion of data, you know, going from kind of tables of mostly numbers to now it doesn't matter what's there and let the algorithm discover features and attributes. Does that, uh, for, for your study, what does that mean? Right. So my, my prior reaction to almost anything is, why is this not new? So for that one, reasons why it strikes me as not new includes the Claude Shannon example that I showed, right? So Claude Shannon had already showed in 1945, declassified in 1949, that you can make a small language model, and it just tightly depends on what corpus you're training on, but you can generate stuff that, you know, will often sound like it was human, right? It parses. And the other thing that makes this question not necessarily new stuff is my earlier point about predictive power versus interpretability, right? We've, we've had methods, you know, Bryman writes about this in 2001. You know, it's been known for a long time that you can generate methods that are really good at prediction for which you just 
you don't stand a chance of interpreting, right? I mean, Bryman, you know, was showing this with random forests in the, I guess the 80s, you know, that you could get really good predictive power and it doesn't mean you can really understand how the model works the way it works. So I think now we need to accept it as a set of design principles. Like, are you trying to design something to be predictive? Are you trying to design something to be interpretable? A little of both. Uh, predictive power is usually easily quantified. There's usually some consensus as to what you're talking about when you talk about predictive power. Interpretability less so. You know, is logistic regression interpretable? Well, it kind of depends. Are the features collinear with each other? Are some of the features binary and some of them real valued with some skewed distribution? Right. I mean, even interpretable, like it's a word we use this as easily as we use words like understanding and can machines think. But as you try to slice it, you realize that it's not exactly clear. And we're on the, you know, two people might have different disagreements about which one is the more interpretable model, so to speak. So so is is feature engineering still a thing? You know, are we are we, you know, we have this cottage industry of people sitting down and thinking through features and all yeah. of that. And it seems to be going away rapidly. What 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 are your thoughts on that? It, with, given abundant data. So feature engineering is useful for uh, predisposing your model to success and for interpretability, right? If you pose the model in the language that people understand, then you stand a chance of it being interpretable, right? Like I've represented, let's say that I've represented language in terms of parts of speech. If I learn something about, you know, noun verb noun, then I have something that's interpretable me because I put in it, I put it into the computer, right? I chose that as my schema. Uh, but you also predispose yourself to success, which is something you need to do when you have limited data sets. Part of the lesson here is when you have abundant data sets, and when you have abundant computation, you don't necessarily need to work as hard on the feature engineering. And in fact, it may be constraining you away from a solution which tells a story which is not as simple as the story that you think is true, right? Natural language, for example, is full of, full of exceptions, right? Mm -hmm. So you think you know how language works, roughly. But, you know, it's all sorts of different special cases, and it's dynamic. So it turns out in many problems, if you have abundant data, you don't need to work so hard on feature engineering. Um, and I, I'd like to believe that the current explosion of interest is a special case of that more general phenomenon. Uh, before I shift out of kind of the more uh, technical into the, the more business and, and abstract, last question here. Um, something I struggled with, most, most data sets in the world are essentially time series data. Hmm. Most analysis I'm familiar with typically kind of ignores the time series part of it. Feature engineering, to your point, we, we extract some features, we take some summaries, we project them into a space where we kind of lose the, the sequence and the time seriness of it. Yeah. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Has that come up as you study things, kind of time series versus flat data? And what does that mean? Well, you're definitely right that in my academic work, I'm usually looking at flat data. Let's say, for example, 20 years ago, you're looking at sequence data and microarray data. It's not time series data to that. There's a bunch, there's big data by biological standards, but it's not dynamic. However, I mean, think about the problem Claude Shannon was solving, right? It's a Markov model. Mm -hmm. It's very temporal in the sense that every word follows from the other word. And in fact, some of the most attention getting Models right now are models about predicting the next word, not necessarily a word left out in the middle, as we were doing with word defect, but literally the next word, right? That is a time series problem in which you have a bunch of tokens, they follow after each other in a way that you could call time, right? Words on a page, for example, flows like time. So I would say time series data are still there. We're still working with it. In addition to places in which it's sort of obviously and explicitly time, let's say climate modeling or something like that, which is an exciting big data problem. Or, or web logs or you know, any, anything with events happening one after the other. Event data in a company right. is absolutely time series data. You're right. So the other thing about um, users is they change. So you often are in a situation where you're building a digital product and you need to build a model that forgets. Right? The news business is an example, right? News is only new when it's news. Right, sorry, it's news is only news when it's new, yep. right? So explicitly, if you're in, I don't know, Yahoo was recommending news stories, explicitly you need to think about how to throw away the old data as the laws of physics change, which really means user behavior is constantly changing. Yeah, Re recommending old news is probably not right. a profitable thing. Um, so shifting, shifting out now to kind of your experience at the New York Times and your role there, um, how, how, is data, how is data thought of as an asset? Uh, at the New York Times, what what are the issues you worry about in your role? 
I would say that the New York Times data is thought about as an asset and a product, certainly for internal product consumption. So it's important to think about the data as being valuable, but it's also important to think about the working of some community, for example, as a, for example, a um, company, as a place in which you might have one part of the org that's making sure that the data are captured, another part of the org that's um, responsible for making sure that the data are accessible and available, and that they are useful, and making sure the data is useful is like a product concern. It's like a product manager's concern, which means different people parts in the org have to actually talk to each other, understand what the pain points are for different product owners, business owners, and make sure that you're creating um, data products, right? So those data products could be scheduled processes that do extract, transform, load, present the data in a way that's cost-effective, accurate, meets the needs of some real human being. So uh, I, would, I would say the way you framed it is at a minimum. It's certainly seen as an asset, but even more than an asset, it's thought of as a product, something that you, you actually think about. Who is the user and what are you going to do to turn the material, to process the raw material into something that's, that's useful to a real human being? And when it's done within a company, it's great because you know the entire addressable market. I mean, you can just go talk to the team that's going to be using the product that you're building. I would say that I would say that you need to make it an asset, but also a product. So, since we're talking about New York Times, let's talk about journalism and and data and kind of the new AI with with journalism. Um, how do you foresee the? And this question came from online. How do you foresee the integration of speech interfaces in journalism? Are there specific use cases where you imagine users interacting with the content through speech, and does that kind of change the nature of a article? Um, well, first I should say I'm not a journalist, so I, yeah. don't, I don't actually have the craft of journalism. But from a product perspective, that is one of the things that the New York Times has invested in, is making more and more of the content available as audio, so that you can make auto automatically generated audio. Uh, and again, that gets back to norms. Like podcasts you know, happened decades ago. They just sort of didn't thrive until maybe five years ago. So people's norms and the way they choose to use technology has changed such that now people really enjoy listening to audio. Um, as to whether or not people could use free speech to interact, I don't see why not. I mean, in some way you're doing it if, you, if you're doing a search on the phone and instead of typing in the topic you're looking for, you press the um, speech to text feature, right? Then you've done the same thing that in principle, the, in principle, the journalism company could have done it too. Uh, it's just you're doing it on the phone as the front end to turn it into speech to text rather than asking the company to turn your speech to text. Except as now that as a navigation tool, that is, yeah, I can see it being really useful for efficiency of the user. Yeah, that definitely, kind of as a search tool. But, but does this change kind of the nature of what you think about when you write an article? If somebody's not going to kind of linearly traverse it, like the author meant them to to read through it. But they may be asking questions back and forth and hopping around different parts of it. Does does that kind of pose an interesting challenge or anything new we have to think about? That sounds super fun, <laughs> and I would say that's a great question to ask somebody who possesses the craft of journalism. Yeah. Because I mean, as a data scientist, like there are things that I know well, but like the craft of storytelling and how to be creative with that, I, I don't I don't make any claims to being a creative storyteller. Fair. So um, another question from online: How how do you think the emergence of a generation born into AI-driven world will, will influence journalism. What types of changes do you anticipate in response to this shift from a population that didn't know AI to a population that was born into it? Hmm. Yeah, that's hard to predict. I mean, I would say the product change has been a big one in which people went from experiencing news as a dead tree laid out on the table for half an hour at a time to experiencing reality in the palm of their hand while they're waiting for the light to change. So that product change, I think, had, had a big change in the way people interact with information generally. As far as AI, um, that is hard to predict, right? Because again, it's about technology, but also people's norms and, and markets. So it's, um, it's uncharted territory. Okay, one more question from online, and then we'll take some questions from the room. If you have a question, think, think about it and raise your hand. So we're in a world where kind of generative AI is making it easy to get at summaries, to generate candidate explanations, uh, to do kind of knowledge economy tasks uh, on our behalf. Um, how, how do we need to think about data and data analysis here? 
um, the modification that came online was as AI continues to automate various aspects of our life, it also promises to bring automation to data science. Uh, what will the future role of a data scientist be? What career advice would you offer aspiring data scientists to help them adapt to an AI-driven world? I mean, a good example there is writing code. So if you're generating code, you ideally, you have a vision in your head for the design of the analysis. Then you have to put it into code. And it's called code because it's not natural language, right? It's, it's as though you're encoding something in a way that somebody else will understand, specifically the computer or the compiler will understand it. That involves a lot of specialized syntax, which you generally spend a lot of time looking up or doing it by trial and error. So AI clearly can make that a lot more efficient, that part of the task, not the designing the problem in your head, but getting the syntax right. That said, it is often wrong, right? The same way that Stack Overflow is often wrong, right? Any AI that's helping you out is often gonna get it wrong. So there's, uh, I would say, increase, increased need for vigilance and QA on the part of the developer to make sure that it's um, generating the results you want. And that can involve test-driven development where you make a set of small tests and make sure that the fundamental routines are doing what they're supposed to do. But it can involve reading the code. So, I mean, the best way for people to know that the code is doing what it does is to actually read the code. So whether or not you write the code from scratch or whether or not you design the algorithm and then work with a tool to turn your natural language into computer code, I, I think there's still going to be a, a lot of role for human beings there, right? The human beings understand computation well enough to design the algorithm in their heads, and then they have to make sure that they design through what are the tests that the code should pass in order to work the way you think it's supposed to work, and then actually reading it to verify that it's doing what you think it's supposed to be doing. Those are all things for which humans are still useful. Read, read the code, and it's not just read the code, it's actually understand the code, which sure. emphasizes something I care a lot about, which is the importance of skill. Like mm -hmm. Those who have the skill can leverage these new tools so much better than those who are not as good programmers, if you're talking about programming. But whatever skill it is that, that, that you're using, which which kind of, to me, gives hope to higher education, right? We still have a, a role to produce people that have the skill. Um, any questions in the in the room? Yeah. I think a, a mic is coming your way. Uh, Dr. Uh, Wiggins, I um, appreciated your holistic view of the um, of data science and AI. Now, uh, I do have a you know question for the audience. It can be rhetorical, but who here has uh, read reviews either on Facebook or Google before you visit a healthcare professional? <laughs> okay, yeah, I know I do. I read almost all of them, but um, I came across. Uh, a dentist who was uh, uh, trying to protect his reputation, had a lot of good reviews, a lot of five-star reviews, um, but I was saddened to uh, see in the last few days that uh, he used Verdi. Now, um, Verdi is, as I looked up, it's a reputation and customer experience management platform for local businesses and brands. Now, the concerning thing about Verdi in 2024 was that uh, BirdEye ranks number four in AI and dominates G2's uh, 2024 software awards. So with this dominant approach, and you said the people in power are using AI to obviously protect their reputation, uh, how do consumers, how can millennial consumers who look at these reviews and think they're making an objective uh, decision on the quality of their healthcare, um, you know, how can they move forward in this climate. Yeah, so that problem of authenticity of what appears to be crowdsourced is not new to the last two years. Um, examples include uh, allegations of Yelp or other review sites that either encourage people to give good reviews or encourage company owners to, to you know, provide advertising in exchange for suppressing bad reviews or things like that. So there's, there's a long history before the last two years of people being concerned about the authenticity of what appears to be organically generated, user-generated content. Um, in terms of what are people to do, I would say skepticism, right? So there's some level of skepticism that's sort of one part of the game, such that you know people need to be appropriately skeptical of what they see online and understand that like 
you need to triangulate across multiple sources and you need to have some skepticism and to look for various tells either in terms of the language or consistency of multiple different views you know small tweaks like a product decision like verified user for example you verified purchase right those are all ways that you were all constantly involved in this little arms race between platform companies and the market to try to convince the market that some feature that the, the platform company provides is is trustworthy Liz, I know we have a few hundred people online. Any questions you want to read from online? And is there, in the meantime, anybody have a question in the room before I shift over to my question? Okay, so online. Okay. What do you see as the main development trends for data-driven technologies and automated decision systems in the coming years? How should software engineers prepare for these trends? Well, efficiency is a big one. So software engineering is getting more and more efficient all the time. Uh, and there's abundant AI tools to make it easy to go from uh, natural language into computer language. Again, with the caveat that it still requires somebody to understand the algorithm at a high level to design the solution. And it still requires a software developer to develop the tests or to read and understand the code. So um, at least with respect to what should software engineers do, I would say to, to stay conversant in how to use efficiency, efficiency enhancing tools, but as with user generated content to maintain skepticism because just because it's fast doesn't mean it's right. And so um, there's still a need for people to understand the algorithms well enough to design it well, to check it under testing, and to actually read and understand the code to ensure that it's not only efficient, but accurate. Um, is there a new type of uh, science and scientific analysis over data that will be enabled by these new types of AI algorithms that seem to do more of the analysis implicitly. Another way to say this question is, is the scientific method and our way of doing research going to change? So, um, golly. So so first, <laughs> we could have a side conversation about the scientific method. And is it real? And do scientists actually use the scientific method? Um, but let's not go down. You, you just alienated a whole bunch of people now in our audience. That, but... <laughs> so that, 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 that's the whole literature that we won't even open up. Um, instead, Let's talk about what is enabled there. So again, data analysis, just like software engineering, it's um, it's being made more efficient via these tools, but it's not necessarily right. So you can you can give these tools a, a data table and ask it to do magic, and sometimes you just get a fail. Sometimes you get something that's a result, and like on the face of it, just doesn't look right at all. Yep. Worse, sometimes you get a result that looks like it's kind of reasonable, and then you share it with your friends, and then later you realize, wait, that, that didn't make any sense at all. Yes. I was able to get that line exactly like I wanted to get, but not doing the transformation that I thought it was doing. So um, yeah, efficiency yeah, efficiency versus QA, I guess, is, is, is true for all of these things, which are these tools are able to make you go fast, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it hasn't broken something on the way. And so you need to understand the system and to have some intuition in advance for what the graph should look look like, so to speak, uh, so that you can do some rigorous QA on any on any result that's produced using these tools. Yeah, and to to paraphrase my colleague at the Rue Institute, uh, uh, Professor Ray Winslow, AI as a as an effective member of the scientific investigation team. So it's got it's got its roles in proposing hypotheses and ideas and so forth. Um, Here's a, here's a tough question. Why has it been so hard to shift, shift away from the current model of personal data collection that dominates the internet and society? We seem to be getting deeper and deeper on everybody effectively kind of using your personal data, more of it, more of it. And why, why has that worked so far? Why hasn't that caused the revolution? Uh, well, I think the answers given by other people at lunch today speak to it. So I will take the way of the coward and quote other people. So at lunch today, somebody else was saying that there's a convenience privacy trade-off, you know, that a lot of these tools are extremely convenient. And so people would rather not think about the privacy implications of it. Um, there's also, of course, power and incumbency. Like 
often the people providing these tools are already well resourced, which means they not only have the tools, they also have marketing ability to um, encourage people to use the tools. But the privacy versus convenience one has been around um, as an argument for a while. There's a uh, talk from 2010 by the law professor at Columbia, Eben Moglen, called Freedom, Freedom and Privacy in the Cloud, which includes the line, these companies give you free documents in the cloud, free email in the cloud, and in exchange, they give you free spying on you all the cloud. Free, free spying on you all the time. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't matter to you because you're not seeing any visible harms for it, then people will make that trade-off. They will have the convenience in exchange for their data being uh, you know, exfiltrated and stored forever and leveraged for, for commercial purposes. Yeah, except the problem is that people think it has no harm until it comes back and kind of does its bite on them. Yes, yeah, so the, the legal scholar Frank Pasquale says that these harms are, I think he says, stochastic and invisible, meaning it's not a visible harm, like you know, being in a car crash without a seatbelt. That's a visible harm. You can see the consequences as opposed to a data breach. And stochastic in the sense of you know, you're sort of rolling dice every time you use these services. I'm using the same password twice. Is something bad going to happen? Maybe not, but you know, it might something very bad may happen with yep. no probability. Yep. Um, almost at the end here, Liz, if there's any questions, let me know. I'll, I'll ask. Okay, go ahead with a one line question. Okay. As chief data scientist at the New York Times, are you involved in the many online games like Wordle, Spelling Bee, or Connections? Love those. Uh, what role should gaming have in the development of AI? Hmm. The answer to the first question is easy. No. Um, too busy <laughs> I've, got, I've got other fish to fry and also like again it's just like there are people who are very good at that skill I, I do not have that skill um, what is the role of gaming and AI that's a really interesting one historically for example uh, the hardware the chips that are powering most of AI were really developed for gaming right NVIDIA had various moments of existential risk and in some of those moments when NVIDIA was at existential risk it was saved by gaming industry because right? they were building chips that were used for Graphics processors, they are called GPU, the G is for graphics after all. Um, so gaming and AI has a intimately associated history right now. Another way in which gaming features into the history of AI is as a source of abundant data. So collecting data is expensive and it's a hassle. One way to collect an abundant data set is to make a well-defined game and then to have a machine play itself against that game. And so a lot of the early wins in machine learning, including the paper that coined the term machine learning, were about data sets playing checkers or chess with the machine against itself. Samuel's checkers, exactly. checkers player. Exactly. So Samuel's paper is the paper from 1959 that people uh, give the term machine learning. It was a paper about checkers. Um, and of course, AlphaGo. So AlphaGo, as an as an eye-popping example from a couple of years ago of getting a artificial intelligence to play Go, Part of the way that um, was done was not by recording an infinite, uh, recording a large number of human Go players. It was by spelling out the rules of Go and having computers just play each other. So gaming actually has a long history, intimately associated with AI as a source of hardware, the first point that I said, and then on a longer time scale as a source of abundant data sets for training AI. Our last question. Uh, if there's nothing in the room, I will ask it. Any questions in the room? Okay, we're almost at time. So as we educate future generations of statistical modelers and analysts, of data scientists and machine learning practitioners, what is it that we need to start doing differently from a data perspective? How do we prepare the future generation of scientists and analytics? And, and what are the deeper implications on data, how we collect it, how we think about it? I mean, I think it depends on the roles that the person is going to occupy. I do think that data, in, in general, I think that the use of data comes with a lack of critical inquiry about how the data were created. You know, if you think about um, bias in data, right? bias in data is often a term people use when they realize that they thought the data set said one thing, but it actually meant something else, right? And they're sort of surprised at how the data were really generated. For example, when people talk about crime stats, statistics on crime, and what they really mean is statistics on arrests, right? And there's lots of things that go into an arrest happening that are very different than whether or not a crime happens. So that's an example of bias. In general, people treat data as though it's a thing that is given to them, which is right there in the word data, given, and therefore not to be questioned. 
So I think there's a lot of work for any data professional to think about how were these data sets generated. Less so if you work in industry and the data were created as a form of instrumentation. So let's say you have a website and you work with software engineering teams that make sure that the website is well instrumented and fires off a bunch of data. You have some sense of how the data were created because your friend wrote the code that's for even you yourself wrote the code that's going to fire off the events and, and created the data. There, I think, is an environment in which the unsung story of data is data as a product, meaning you're creating a data set to solve somebody else's problem. And that's sort of an aspect of design, right? Design is the intentional solution to a problem within a set of constraints. What is the problem that you're solving? There's usually some other person you need to understand them, understand their pain. And a lot of data practitioners think it's about the math. It's about the loss function and like argument over all theta in set omega of some loss function with theta and theta in it. Oh, nicely all, said. <laughs> all the work goes into thinking about the loss function. What is the set omega of possible hypotheses? And then what is the algo that's going to find that argument? None of that is product thinking. Product thinking is like thinking about like, who is the person who I want to bring a smile to their face? What problem do they have? What pains do they have? How am I going to build some solution that meets their problem? So I would say for data science in general, we focus on the tech nugget at the heart of data science, but we don't much go upstream and downstream. Upstream to where the data is coming from, what sort of critical questions should we ask about how those data were generated, and then downstream into what problem are we actually solving with our analysis. And that involves product thinking, design thinking, and actually talking to a human being who you want to make happy. Data science outputs as products. And on that uh, very optimistic uh, comment, Please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Chris Wiggins for a most amazing talk. Thank you and uh, see you in a couple of weeks.